So it is Thursday of DrupalCon, last day of the conference. Uh, energy's probably running a little bit low, so we'll do our best to make this session energetic and entertaining. Uh, we'll be talking about Drupal's big B2B commerce opportunity. Uh, we'll also be, uh-oh, probably touched something I wasn't supposed to. There we go. Just went to sleep on me. We'll also be doing some storytelling with some hopefully recognizable New Orleans imagery uh, to make the, the uh, conversation a little bit more uh, fun and entertaining. Uh, quick show of hands before we get started. Folks that are currently uh, have experience using Drupal and Drupal Commerce. Okay, so about half the room there. Uh, folks that are interested in, you know, potentially have a project that may involve uh, some commerce requirements. Sounds like that's about everybody else. Okay, so. You're sort of in the right place then. Uh, we're here to talk about Drupal and Drupal Commerce. Uh, again, I'm Chris Rooney. This is my colleague, Madison Major, over, the, over here. And this is a site building track uh, session. So we'll talk about how to use components, modules, kind of widgets available in Drupal to help build e-commerce sites. We're also going to do some uh, business-oriented content myself. My background, I'm not a developer, so I kind of understand these things at a conceptual level. So we'll understand how uh, Drupal and Drupal Commerce help solve some, um, some B2B challenges from a conceptual level. Now, one thing to be aware of, um, think through or if you are in the right place. So there is another session going on right now at this very same time uh, with the Commerce guys talking about uh, Drupal Commerce 2.0, which will be released later on this year and will line up with, uh, with Drupal 8. And that will be more of a development-oriented uh, discussion. So if you're really into the bits and bytes of uh, Drupal Commerce and want to understand how to write hooks and, and nooks and crannies and things like that, um, that might be a better place for you. Uh, but here we're going to talk about uh, Drupal and Drupal Commerce from more of a business perspective and how some of the features and modules uh, line up really well with some of the requirements that we've seen uh, with, with uh, B2B manufacturers. Uh, but it is fairly unique because all the commerce guys are actually in one room at the same time over there. So if you want to see that, uh, you can go over there and make that happen. So who that? Who's Digital Bridge Solutions first? Give you a little bit of context on our company. Uh, we're a full life cycle Drupal development agency. We started in 2009. Um, this is our fifth DrupalCon and our first time speaking at DrupalCon. So be gentle, be nice. Uh, we're excited to do it. We are uh, Aqua partners. We're supporting members of the Drupal Association. And some of our example Drupal Commerce clients are across the bottom. Uh, you'll see these are mid-size enterprises or manufacturers who we've helped to use, uh, to dr use Drupal to start selling their goods and services online uh, to other businesses. So a bit about us and a bit about myself and Madison. Contact information is up here. Our uh, uh, Drupal.org uh, information is up here. Twitter address is up here. And we will flash up our uh, uh, survey review. Uh, link at the, towards the end of the presentation so you can review our, our session as well. So a bit about us and our background and context for, uh, for being in front of you today. Agenda today. So we're going to talk about just some e-commerce basics to make sure we all have kind of a level set on uh, what we're talking about when we talk about e-commerce. We'll talk about B2B e-commerce trends and what's happening in that space. Uh, and there's literally an, uh, an explosion of opportunity happening there. We'll talk about some challenges uh, with B2B transactions and why those are more difficult than your typical uh, B2C e-commerce transaction. Uh, we'll finally wrap up with Drupal, Drupal's value proposition in that space as a B2B commerce platform and then opportunities and challenges for Drupal going forward with, uh, with Drupal Commerce. Sound all right? And away we go. So as I mentioned, we're going to try to use some, some New Orleans imagery to kind of tell the story a little better and tie things in for us. When we talk about e-commerce, people oftentimes think about E-commerce is just facilitating transactions, right? Just collecting money for stuff online. Uh, when we think about commerce, we think about it it's a little bit more, more difficult than that. It's more than just the bling bling, right? So as our, our friends uh, Lil, Lil Wayne and, uh, and, and Baby would say, uh, yes, there's, there's opportunity to make, uh, to make money here. Yes, there's, there's bling bling available. But e-commerce is much more uh, complex and, uh, and nuanced thing than just taking money online, right? So when we talk about e-commerce, we talk about a number of different uh, components. So it's the display, right? Everything from how you're displaying your goods and services online from a laptop, tablet, mobile phone, and making sure that that feels simple and intuitive to the user. Um, it's the product catalog. So much, many of our clients have thousands, sometimes millions of products 
that need to be stored in their product catalog and information about those products need to be stored in a database and served up to a user uh, online in a in a easy fashion. Um, it's merchandising. So we've got here a little picture of a, a little convenience store and an end cap in a convenience store. So merchandising means basically displaying your products and services in a way that's going to be attractive to user and make them want to buy it. Um, yes, it's the transaction. Yes, there's taking money. That's a big part of it as well. But it's also things like warehousing and fulfillment, right? So once you take an order online, how do you tell your warehouse to put something in a box, ship it to someone? How do you handle returns? Uh, and then finally, it's integration. It's integrating all those different pieces together and integrating them in with your back-end system of records. So when we think about e-commerce, we really try to think about and touch on all those six different areas. And when you're doing that, it gets pretty complex. So e-commerce is hard. Um, e-commerce is challenging. Uh, juvenile would say, if you don't handle your biz, you can't be crying and suffering, right? Famous uh, uh, New Orleans hip-hop artist. Uh, you should all add them to your collection when you get home. Uh, so why is it hard? There's functional complexity, right? Um, there's a lot more to handle uh, in your commerce site because it just needs to do more. There are UX challenges, especially when it's to design. Let's imagine you have a product catalog that has 300,000 products in it. How do you help someone parse that catalog on a phone uh, and still make that, that user experience intuitive? Uh, security and compliance, right? If you're protecting or if you're taking any credit card data uh, in from a, from a buyer and storing that information on your systems, there's lots of regulations, compliance uh, guidelines uh, that you need to, to uh, abide by to be PCI compliant to make sure that you're protecting your credit card information and personally identifiable information uh, as you should be. Integration challenges, as we talked about before, uh, and then performance and availability really, ma really matter. So when we're working for like a nonprofit uh, client and the site is slow or the site goes down, they get bombed. It's an issue, right? But if you're working for a, uh, a client, uh, one of our clients does 80% of their revenue in the last two months of the year during the holiday season. And so if the site's slow during that time or the site goes down, people get really, really upset, right? Uh, and sometimes people get fired. Uh, so the stakes are high in this, uh, in this, in this space. Um, and not only is, is uh, uh, it difficult for, for B2C commerce, but B2B is even harder. So let's spend a minute talking about what we mean uh, by business to business commerce. So we're talking about basically online transactions between organizations. Now everybody knows uh, Dunder Mifflin from the office, right? So let's take them as an example uh, of an organization that may look to sell their goods and services online. So what does it mean when they do that? Um, and what are the characteristics of a typical B2B commerce transaction? Well, one is that the transaction dollar amounts are typically higher, right? So we're not just buying a pair of sweatpants for 50 bucks. Um, oftentimes we're buying things in the thousands or tens of thousands for each individual transaction, right? So the dollar amounts are a lot higher uh, in B2B commerce. Um, two is that oftentimes uh, organizations buy from another frequently and they expect a level of personalization or they expect a, a level of uh, repeat purchase where they want to know the last things that they order and they want to be able to buy those things uh, quickly and easily uh, in a very facilitated fashion. So there's less kind of anonymous checkout in the BDB space. Organizations are buying from each other over and over and over again. There's a distinction between buyers and users. So a lot of times in a B2B environment, the person that's actually buying that item could be a purchasing agent and they have no idea what they're buying. They don't really know what the, the, the value proposition of it, of it is. They just know they were told to buy it, and they were told to buy it in this amount. Um, and somebody else is actually going to be the user of it. So that poses some unique challenges to the, uh, to the user experience and experience design. Uh, and a lot of this is happening It's because there's channel shift happening. So traditionally, e-commerce transactions have happened via fax, phone, email, talking to a direct sales rep. And all that is gradually shifting over to, uh, to, to online channel. Uh, and a lot of what's happening in that is just a newer generation of, of users and, uh, uh, and owners of B2B organizations who are, who are trying to take advantage of, of the internet to help change their, their business. Um, so it's more complex, B2B commerce is more complex than even your typical already challenging B2C uh, commerce initiative. All right, so let's talk about trends, what's happening in the B2B space. Um, so there's a huge storm coming in B2B and it's going to drastically change the landscape of organizations that sell to each other now um, and the landscape will be forever changed after that, right? And some of the organizations that are not selling on online may not make it, frankly, after that fact. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about what's happening in that 
in that B2B space and, and how that storm is going to affect us. Uh, so first of all, the internet is already being used in business to business transactions as a research tool, right? So over 80% of business to business buyers use the internet already before they make a purchase. Uh, so that means for people who are, who are selling B2B goods and services, boy, you better have your product catalog online and better have all your information about that product available so somebody can help make an informed decision. Even if you're not going to allow the purchase, at least allow that person to be able to research online. Uh, and B2B buyers are also using Google as a starting point, right, and collecting a lot of information before they even, uh, before they even uh, call up a salesperson. Uh, the other thing to be aware of is just the enormity of transaction volume in the B2B space. So there's real buying already happening in B2B, and the amount of transaction volume from uh, one organization to the other, buying from each other in the e-commerce space is more than twice what's happening in the BDC space. So it's really a, 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 the big dog looking down at the little dog, right? We always pay a lot of attention to what's happening in the BDC commerce trends, but already there's way more volume happening um, in B2B. So there's really a huge, um, huge opportunity. A lot of big companies are already there um, making a lot of money. Uh, and we may be at a point where on the B2C side, we may be at peak B2C e-commerce, right? Each of the successive years, the rate of change, the rate of growth in the B2C commerce space has decreased by over 30% in the last, last three years. So the B2C opportunity is not growing as much. Um, so organizations that are in the business of servicing uh, e-commerce are all seeing the same opportunity and all trying to shift their sights on, on the business-to-business -business commerce opportunity. So let's talk through a couple more statistics about how big this area is. Uh, so 57% of B2B buyers say that they made most of their decision online researching before they even call the sales rep, right? So it just enforces the, the importance of having your information available, accurate information that allows someone to make a buying decision because they're doing all that stuff first before they're calling a the sales rep. Um, now, we get start to get a little bit of a gap in opportunity. There's only 40% of B2B companies that say they sell anything online, any of their stuff. And of that 40%, if you ask them how many of them are actually proud of their e-commerce site or actually driving your real volume through it, it's probably less than half of them. So there's a disconnect between what the B2B buyer wants and what the B2B supplier or company is actually able to provide right now. And over 50% of, of uh, B2B buyers anticipate they're going to buy even more online. And when they do buy online, the statistics around conversion rate are pretty amazing, right? So B2B buyers are typically very goal-oriented when they come to a site, and they're not just there to window shop. They're usually, they're usually to buy. So conversion rates typically are around 16% in the B2B space, which is like five times as much as you would see on a typical B2C site. Um, so all this emphasizes this kind of growing opportunity where buyers are wanting to buy more online, uh, and uh, sellers, um, people who are selling uh, goods, are not always able to sell their goods and services online, they recognize the opportunity uh, and they're realizing they need to get their catalog online and be able to, to facilitate online sales in the next couple of years. So let's talk through challenges uh, or why is that reasons why B2B commerce is especially hard. Uh, so we've talked about this very appetizing meal that's available in the B2B commerce space, but boy, there's some like some pincers you got to be aware of. There's some, uh, if you're going to eat one of those crawfish and it's not, it's still alive, boy, you better watch out for the, the nasty end of one of those before you put it in your mouth. So we'll talk about um, that opportunity um, and, and how to avoid some of those challenges and how Drupal Commerce can mitigate some of those challenges. So with that, um, I'm going to talk through, we're going to talk through five areas, right? Five things that are kind of very unique to B2B Commerce that actually Drupal and Drupal Commerce handles these things pretty well. So the five things we'll talk through are customer-specific pricing, uh, volume pricing, payment methods, customer versus user accounts, and customer portal. We'll talk through each of those things in detail. And to help me with that, my lovely assistant Madison is going to help me do a little bit of, uh, of role-playing here. Uh, so the first area we want to talk about is customer-specific pricing. And I use the imagery of a nice big pot of jambalaya because that's a good example of what a typical B2B pricing scenario looks like. It's a mixture of a whole bunch of stuff, right? And typically, no customer plays, pays the same amount for the same thing, right? Some pay, customers pay twice as much of another one uh, sometimes. Uh, and a lot of times, the way typical e-commerce platforms will try to solve that is through a price list, 
a listing of all of the uh, uh, of all your SKUs on the, on the on the site and how much each of them cost, and you may have a preferred price list, and you may have like a discounted price list, and you may have another price list and another currency. But the idea with most commerce platforms is that anytime you're going to charge a different cost or different price for something, you create a new price list. That model starts to break down when you have a customer specific pricing and everybody's paying something different. Uh, the other unique challenge oftentimes with B2B commerce is figuring out what's the system of record for price. Does that price exist in a back end ERP system? Does it exist in somebody's spreadsheet? Most uh, commerce platforms kind of want the pricing to exist in the commerce platform and have that be the system of record. Uh, but that can also pose some challenges. Uh, so what we're going to do here is a little bit of role playing here and uh, uh, we'll talk through some unique pricing scenarios and I'm going to be the uh, client and Madison's going to be the consultant trying to sell me a, a particular piece of technology. Uh, we'll talk through a couple things in this, in this scenario. The other thing we'll talk about is volume pricing that you often see in a B2B scenario. I'm using the example of beignets here because if you go up to Cafe du Monde and want to order one beignet, they're going to charge you $2. But if you, uh, if you go up there and order a dozen, maybe they'll charge you $20. And so you have a different unit cost right, if you buy more. If you buy 60, maybe they'll charge you an even lower unit cost, right? So the more you buy, you pay a lower, pay a lower unit cost. Um, sometimes that can be challenging in the B2B space if your breakpoints for the different products you sell are different. So some of the items you may say, all right, I want to give a customer a price break if they buy more than 10. But another product you may say, I want to give that customer a break point if they buy, buy more than 25 or 50, and that may different from, uh, differ from product to product. So the things you want to watch out for in this role play is how quickly after I give Madison my, my requirements, he uses the word customization. Um, and, and, and he's going to be trying to sell me a typical unnamed off the shelf uh, uh, commerce solution. Um, and, and how often, uh, are, how much he tries to get me to bend my requirements to meet his, uh, his platform's capabilities. So yeah, let's before we get started, how many of those uh, people in the audience are with uh, you know, Drupal shops, Drupal agencies, do some type of like system implementation today? Just show a hand real quickly. And is anyone here actually a, uh, you know, a retailer or uh, an organization, manufacturer, distributor who might actually sell goods and services online? Okay, so we've got a couple as well. So. Yeah, as Chris said, I'm going to play two roles, so I should have brought my two different hats. I'll have to get consulting hats to wear for the next time we do this. But um, in the first scenario, I'm going to be the guy selling kind of your typical off-the-shelf commerce platform. So we won't, we won't mention any of those by name at this point, but you guys probably know who those are if you're in the e-commerce space at all. So these are packaged platforms that have very specific commerce uh, architectures. Um, and then the second scenario that we do with each of these, uh, I'm going to play more of the consultant um, that we play every day who works with uh, Drupal and is used to kind of a flexible commerce system. So. All right, so scenario one, I am a, a, a company and I make plumbing tools and I have a catalog of of 100,000 products and I've got 3,000 customers that I sell them to. And it's my grandfather's company and it's been running for 100 years. So. Mr. E-commerce consultant. Yes, sir. I need you to build me an e-commerce site, but I need you to be aware, boy, I've got customer-specific pricing. Can you do that? Oh, yeah, customer-specific pricing. Yeah, our, our e-commerce system totally handles that. Let's see. Um, so that means it's probably broken down into groups. You have two or three different groups of customers, maybe, and they, they each get their own uh, custom price. List. No, no, I'm not sure you're understanding me. I have customer-specific pricing. My customers pay different amounts for the products that I buy. Can you do that? Oh, yeah, sure. You guys have, I mean, I know you've been around a long time. You guys probably have, what, 15, 20, 30 customers. So we, we can probably create custom price lists for each one of those. Listen, I have customer specific pricing. I have 3,000 customers. My grandfather built this customer with the, this company, with his own sweat and blood. I know all of those 3,000 customers by name, and they negotiate their pricing with me directly. Can you handle that? Oh, yeah, totally, totally. 3,000 customers, they each get a flat percentage off. That's probably broken down into uh, a few tiers, right? A few 10% uh, off. Yeah, not so much. Off, or... Yeah, we, we, we could probably do that. A lot of customization. There's going to be some 
you know, maybe 3,000 extra tables in that database. There's going to be some performance concerns. We'll, we'll figure that out. Customization sounds pricey. Well, it depends. I mean, how much money do you have? <laughs> All right. And seen. Okay. Now let's try that again with Drupal Commerce. So, again, I am the client uh, with my plumbing company, and Madison is a different system integrator coming in to talk to me about Drupal Commerce. So, Mr. E commerce consultant, boy, I need you to build me a, an e commerce site for my company. We need to get online, man. There's a whole opportunity out there for us. But you need to know, man, I've got customer specific pricing. Can you do that? Customer specific pricing. So let's define that. Are you saying that each customer that you work with, each customer that you deal with, has uh, specific pricing that's unique to them? That's what I'm saying. Okay, okay. How many customers do you have today? We have 3,000 customers. 3,000 customers, and they each have negotiated pricing across your entire catalog. I have negotiated pricing. Me or my father or my grandfather negotiated pricing with every single one of those. We know them by name. I understand. I understand. So do you have that information uh, centralized somewhere? Is this, is this only in your head, or do we have that potentially in a, a system of record? Well, we have it in our home-built ERP. Your home-built ERP. Okay. Okay. Well, is that home-built... Uh, uh, ERP, is it up-to-date and current with all the information for these, uh, for these customers and their pricing? For the most part. Okay, perfect. So the great thing about Drupal Commerce is it has uh, a really open uh, API and multiple ways to get data in and out. So I know your homegrown ERP may not have an API that we can connect to, but there's multiple ways using either feeds or migrate, which we can get access to that database, pull that information in, and record that uh, within Drupal. There's also multiple Drupal Commerce modules that handle uh, price lists. And it's very easy to build a pricing model um, where the pricing per product or per SKU is unique to each one of your individual 3,000 customers. Well, that sounds great. But you know what? I just remembered I do have this new line of products that we don't have that stuff in my ERP uh, database yet. Matter of fact, uh, my cousin Trudy, who runs our purchasing department, she's got a couple of spreadsheets where those products live and the pricing information is with Trudy. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, as long as we have that information in spreadsheets, there's ways to get that data out as well. My recommendation is, uh, you know, we could take that data from the spreadsheets and get it to your ERP, keep it, cent keep it centralized, and potentially use the same integration that we built earlier. If not, um, we can design a feed to pull that in from your, uh, from your spreadsheets and sit, uh, sit next to the information that we're pulling in from your ERP. Sounds good. It is good. All right. Cool. <laughs> All right. So the next thing we want to talk about is payment methods. Uh, so another unique thing in the e-commerce space uh, is a lot of times transaction will occur without any actual money taking ha uh, changing hands. I like to use the, uh, the the metaphor for Mardi Gras beads here. So a lot of times you can give someone Mardi Gras beads and they will perform some service for you, from what I hear. Um, and those Mardi Gras beads don't have any actual numer or commercial value. They don't have no currency but somehow this exchange of services happens and all you do is give them this thing that doesn't have any monetary value and you get something in return. Well, that's very common to what happens in, uh, in the B2B space, right? Um, so a lot of times in a B2B organization, they will sell something to a customer on a, a payment terms with a net 30 receivables. And that's the way their business works offline and they want to maintain that same thing online and want people to be actual to buy a service, put in their shopping cart, pay for it and have nothing get charged and have them send an invoice in the mail. And that's pretty painful for a lot of uh, traditional off-the-shelf e-commerce platforms where they're built from the ground up to not let somebody check out unless payment has been captured or uh, something has been authorized. So we'll talk through a quick role play here on payment methods with the typical e-commerce platform and then one with Drupal Commerce. So Mr. E-commerce consultant, uh, yes, I, I need you to build me an e-commerce site, but but the way we are, we sell to our customers now, you know, most of them have payment terms, credit terms with us, you know, net 30, net 45 sometime. But I still want to be able to, you know, allow them to buy their stuff online and I'll, I'll send them an invoice and, and they're good for it. Oh, yeah, credit. Yeah, our e-commerce solution handles credit perfectly. We got Visa, MasterCard, American Express, any of those options. No, no, I don't think you understand. No, 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 no. None of my customers are going to check out the credit card. They don't have personal credit cards. Right? They buy from me on account. They have payment terms with me as a company. I see. So ACH payments, all right? So they can write a check, 
personal business checking account. Go through the checkout process. I don't think you're account. listening to me. Listen to me, young man. <laughs> my grandfather built this cus this company, and my comp my customers buy from us on account credit terms. They don't have to pay me anything for another 30 days. Can you handle that or not? You said your grandfather built this company. Ah. Uh, I should have thought, so he's probably using PayPal, right? Yeah, we could totally integrate with PayPal. Perfect, we'll be up and running in a matter of months. Get out of my office. Let's try that again with Drupal Commerce. All right, Mr. E-commerce consultant, I need you to build me a website for my plumbing company, but boy, you gotta understand, my customers have payment terms. They don't always pay me right away. I just send them an invoice and they pay me a little bit after the fact. Can you guys handle that? Okay, I understand. So you don't necessarily need to uh, take payment from the customer at the time of checkout. Is that correct? That oddly sounds like you're listening to me. Yes, that's okay. correct. Okay. Well, the great thing about Drupal Commerce is that it's flexible, and it doesn't actually require payment to be complete um, to actually create an order record. So I, I think we can work with that. Now, you said, they're, you said they're using payment terms, right? So my guess is you're... Maybe per customer you're tracking what their terms are, 30, 45 days, 90 days, something like that? That's one thing our accounting package does real well. It tracks our payment terms, yes. Okay, okay. And also, do, do these customers have maybe a, a specific credit limit? Maybe they can purchase up to a certain amount per month? Well, it depends. Some of them do, and some of them don't. Okay, okay. So, and if they hit that credit limit, or maybe they're not in good standing, would you still want these customers to be able to purchase from you? Well, no, not unless they, not unless they call me, and, and maybe I, you could override them for, for just do them a favor, but no. Okay. And you mentioned that uh, this information was in your accounting package. Is that also getting pulled into your ERP today? Yes. Okay, great. Well, you know, we talked earlier about, uh, you know, either through a, potentially a feed or a migration or a direct query into your current ERP database. So we've already built an integration there. Um, so yeah, we can work on that data mapping to pull that information across uh, and reference that in Drupal, either real time or, or perhaps we store a series of records there. And you know, come to think about it, at checkout, uh, we can use a, a rule system um, which will allow us to determine at the time of checkout whether that customer is able to purchase uh, potentially which payment methods are available to them, if they have credit terms, and if they're in good standing with your company, we can make that decision real time at the point of checkout. Does that sound like something that would fit your needs? Boy, that sounds great to me, but the last guy that was in here, you was throwing on this customization word. How much customization is going to be required to do that? Well, there will be a little bit of customization, because what we find is that uh, each manufacturer, each business has uh, maybe a slightly different setup on their ERP, or a slightly different setup on their system of record. Um, so initially, perhaps through our discovery process, we'll want to get that model uh, mapped out. And what that's going to do is allow you to uh, connect many features of the site back to your ERP system. So uh, the customization is, is light. It's there. Uh, but we can define that up front and, uh, and get you moving rather quickly. All right. Sounds good. And seen. <laughs> All right, so the last couple of things we want to talk about here, the reasons why uh, B2B commerce can be particularly challenging. One of the things we referenced earlier is this concept of customer versus user. And I'm using the metaphor of a Mardi Gras float here, right? Because in this instance, like your actual customer, the client, might be the actual float, the Mardi Gras float. But then there's people in that float that you're actually interacting with. There's people in that float that are throwing out beads um, and interacting with the people on the street. But your commerce system needs to account for both of those, right? That those people actually work for a company and may inherit some of the rules uh, associated with that company. Probably they inherit payment methods, shipping addresses, things like that that are going to be inherited from the, the company. Also important to think through, though, the people in that float, the users, may not all be the same. Some of them may have different levels of authority or purchasing permissions. Some of them may be able to purchase up to $1,000. Some of them may be able to not be able to purchase, purchase anything without an approval from their supervisor. So those sorts of things um, can make a, a, a pretty challenging, highly customized situation with a typical uh, B2C-oriented commerce platform. Um, the other thing I want to talk about here is the need for a customer portal. 
right? So a lot of times in the B2B environment, as we talked about, a lot of these organizations have been transacting with each other for years and years and years, and they want to see the totality of their relationship when they log online into this uh, into a customer's B2B commerce site. So it's more than just the transaction. They want to see things like their order history, whether or not that order was placed online, right? They want to see the order history of things they did over the phone, uh, things that they emailed in. Uh, they also want to be able to pay invoices uh, for outstanding balances. Again, whether or not that was something they bought online. They want to be able to pull up those invoices uh, and pay them via ACH, via credit card, but actually settle up for the things that they bought in the past regardless of channel. They also want things like being able to um, see their sales rep's contact information if they happen to forgot it, right? Or get information about upcoming new product releases. So there's a, like a lot of content around the commerce transaction that really makes it more valuable. And I use the, uh, the imagery of, of Bourbon Street here to give you the experience, uh, the idea that it's not just one of these components that makes the, the Bourbon Street valuable, but it's the music, it's the food, it's the drinking, it's the dancing all together that make the Bourbon Street valuable and make it memorable. If you had just one of those things, it wouldn't quite do it for you. Right? If you just had the music, it wouldn't be the same experience. If you just had the e-commerce transaction for B2B, it wouldn't really meet all your needs at the client. So we'll do another role play here, um, talking through how uh, a typical B2, uh, B2C-oriented commerce platform would try to meet some of these needs around tiered customer accounts between users and companies, and then how they would address the customer portal need. And again, what you want to listen for is how quickly it takes Madison to say the word customization uh, when, we, when he's representing the, the typical e-commerce platform salesperson. Um, um, and also uh, how quickly he tries to, again, try to get me to conform my business requirements into the package's capabilities. So first role play. We'll do tiered accounts and customer portal with a typical e-commerce platform. All right, here we go. So, Mr. E-commerce consultant, I need you to build me sure. an e-commerce site for my grandfather's plumbing company. We've been around for 150 years, and boy, you know, we've got uh, customers. We've got some real big customers, and some of those customers have purchasing agents that need to be able to buy from us. But you know, they still all kind of fit in with that same client. Um, and boy, I need them to be able to see a lot more than just uh, you know th than just the product catalog. They need to kind of pull up their total order history and see their outstanding invoices and pay that stuff online. Can you do that? Oh yeah, totally. We can. Uh, let's see. We can set up an e-commerce system, and it's gonna. What's it's gonna do for you and your customers? It's gonna display every order that customer has ever purchased on the web. Um, so yeah, we can. We can definitely do that. No, no. Hold on. I, I'm, I'm not sure you understand me. I need them to be able to see all their orders, the web ones, but also the ones they phoned in. Can you guys do that? Okay, yeah, if, um, yeah, as long as your salespeople are uh, picking up the phone and then uh, placing that order through your website, uh, we, could, we could potentially show that, show that customer their, uh, their web order. Yeah. No, that's not gonna happen. My salespeople, they key their stuff into the ERP system now. Well, yeah, you know, what we could do is, uh, um, yeah, we could have we could have a two web experiences. We could have one uh, that's going to show all the orders that were placed online. That's that's fine. Then we'll build maybe like a custom uh, experience at a subdomain, right? And that subdomain will say, "Hey, here's all your historical invoices and everything that you placed offline uh, for the last, you know." Well, that years. word "custom" so sounds expensive. Well, I don't know. I mean, it depends. I mean, how much money do you have? <laughs> and seen. All right, let's try that again with. Drupal Commerce. So, Mr. E-commerce consultant, boy, I need you to build me an e-commerce site, but you got to understand, uh, I've got tiered customer accounts. I've got cl uh, customers, but then I've got users within those customers that need to be able to buy stuff from me. Sometimes at different permission levels. And to make it even more complex, I've got a real big customer. Uh, I sell some of my my plumbing supplies to to uh, Ford Motor Company, but I sell it to their division out in Tuscaloosa where I live. But sometimes I get orders from corporate too. So they have different different purchasing rights as well. But they're both Ford, so I need to represent them both in my system and be able to have them both inherit some some level of purchasing power from Ford. Can you guys handle that? Did you say tiered customer accounts? Yes, sir, I did. We may not know this, but I have a twin brother that works for this terrible e-commerce company, and they can't handle that at all. But let me tell you what Drupal Commerce can do. So Drupal Commerce is built with a very flexible user model. And you 
using uh, tools like uh, groups or organic groups um, and using tiered roles and permissions, uh, we can model that to exactly how your business works. Um, my guess is that you know potentially a person might work at an organization, but maybe an organization uh, also rolls up to a parent organization, and there's different attributes and permission levels that need to be inherited. That's right. That correct. And potentially, uh, you know, that person, whether they're a purchaser or not, maybe they need to ship to multiple addresses. So I'm guessing some of your customers have multiple business locations. Is that That's right. right. Okay. So with within the uh, by mixing groups and address book, we can. Uh, create a combination and a system of inheritance um, where that address record can be set up uh, on multiple locations or on multiple businesses and inherit down to the user. Um, we can also design a series of uh, roles and permissions so that user gets the right information to them um, so they know whether they can place the order or whether they have to um, submit it for approval. My guess is also your customers have been ordering from you for a long time. Is this, is this your first time selling direct on the web? This is my first time selling uh, direct to customers online, yes. But boy, I tell you, we've had customers. My grandfather built this company 100 years ago, and one of our customer relationships have been around for 30 years. And I've got to maintain that, that high level of service. Everything they can get from me offline has to be maintained online for them to continue to do business with us. I see. So even for you know your your order history for the last ten or fifteen years, you mentioned having a, uh, an ERP that you guys implemented back in the eighties. So we have a pretty good record of invoice and transaction history in that ERP. Yes, sir. Perfect. So what we can do is with the integration that we mentioned earlier, um, potentially a direct query into that into that database. We can pull information for uh, invoices for order records. Um, even allow them to pay online by integrating directly to that ERP. And, you know, guess what? We handled that a few requirements ago, so we can leverage that technology that we built uh, for a number of requirements throughout this, throughout this process. Well, that sounds great. Your twin brother, he's fired, though. <laughs> All right. All right. So let's talk about Drupal's value proposition in the B2B uh, commerce space. And Madison can talk us through some of these slides. So B2B commerce value proposition. So we've got uh, imagery of uh, Drew Brees from the uh, win of the Super Bowl. Um, so as you guys know, Drew's persona is very positive and good. Drupal's kind of, we're at a point right now, especially with, uh, uh, with Drupal and Drupal commerce and at a point in the industry with this B2B opportunity uh, where there's a lot of promise out there and there's a lot of people interested in this technology. There's also a lot of manufacturers and distributors uh, that need to take Need to take action. Um, so let's talk through um, let's talk through a few of the uh, considerations for B two B. So why Drupal Commerce for B two B? So the first imagery that we have here um, this kind of represents the the two personas that I was playing earlier. So uh, one is is that of a you know think of it as a prefabricated house. So something that uh, uh, that you buy that's built to spec. Um, quite honestly, that's what you're that's what you're getting with a lot of the big enterprise e-commerce platforms that are out there. Um, they're rigid. They've been designed for a certain type of experience. That experience is uh, is businesses uh, selling to consumers and not businesses selling to other businesses. Um, however, with Drupal and Drupal Commerce, um, think of that as more of a foundation. So when you download Drupal, um, when you get access to Drupal, you're getting a platform on which you can build. Um, and that build isn't necessarily always customization. Um, that build, um, you could think of it more as Legos, right? So Drupal has uh, roughly 10,000 modules that are available. It's got hundreds of modules that are useful for uh, B2B commerce and creating some of these data models that we talked about earlier. Um, so very quickly, uh, by assembling your data model and working with your customer, you can start to assemble a solution that is specific to their business. And this is really a key point um, because when you're working in B2B, you are working with a lot of organizations that have been around for a long time, and each one does do their business a little bit differently. And if you try to walk in there with a very rigid uh, commerce infrastructure, it's just not going to fit their business. It's not going to work for them. Um, so you can spend all of your time customizing something rigid that's out of the box, uh, or you can work with Drupal, and like your Lego blocks, you can assemble something that's to 
the specification of that customer's business. Lastly, so why Drupal Commerce for B2B? So Drupal plays well with others. Drupal's very open. It's easy to get data in and out of Drupal. It's also easy to create uh, either custom content types or custom entity types um, to which you can uh, model your customer's business and bring that information into Drupal. Plays well with others, plays well with, uh, with other systems. So we've got multiple examples of customers that came with, to us with um, backends or ERPs um, that have been around for 20 or 30 years. Literally, there were no integrations to. But through direct queries, we can pull that information in, we can reference it real time, and we can create a modern web experience for a business um, whose infrastructure may not be as modern as the web. So is Drupal Commerce, for me, could you be a cash money millionaire? So um, yeah, one of my favorite groups from the, uh, from the 90s, early 2000s there. Uh, also a New Orleans, New Orleans band, uh, band group. Um, anywho, so a few questions to ask. What we've done, we've come up with five qualifying questions in terms of is Drupal Commerce right for you and for your project and for your client? Uh, or should you look to, to go with more of an off-the-shelf kind of commerce solution? So first question I would ask is on the catalog side in terms of your products. Um, are your products complex or are they configurable? Uh, if you're just selling, you know, mugs and t-shirts, if you're just selling kind of regular old uh, consumer-based products, maybe virtual commerce isn't the right fit. But if there is some type of complexity or some type of uh, uh, personalization or, or configuration when it comes to actually selecting or building your product online, it's really easy to build those experiences within Drupal. Secondly, um, do you have complex business rules around the pricing of your product? So we touched on that a lot earlier. So do you have you have uh, volume-based pricing where maybe the, the pricing is the, the breaks in quantity are unique per customer or the breaks in quantity are unique uh, per product. Off-the-shelf commerce platforms are gonna try to wedge you into a very specific setup of how those things can be structured that likely your client who's selling the other businesses has very specific rules. Is your checkout process non-standard? Does it not follow the, hey, enter your billing, shipping, payment information and hit checkout. If there's anything more to it than that, if you need to uh, engage with the customer in a certain way or do custom checks back to the ERP, Drupal Commerce might be, uh, might be right for you. Um, number four, multi-step buying processes. So if you have a need for actual guided selling, so maybe there's more to it than just a customer coming to your site and adding a cart and checking out, and you actually need to customize that experience for them, uh, Drupal's a great fit for that. And last but not least is, do you have anything custom uh, on the back, when I say on the back end, really mean like within the, uh, um, within the pre-existing business side, the back office of the customer's organization that you might need to integrate with in a unique way. Um, so think of this as you know, accounting packages, uh, ERPs, any old systems of record that need that information referenced on the web you're gonna be doing custom integrations or, or pulling or migrating data into your system, a lot of flexibility with Drupal um, that quite frankly, the other commerce platforms just can't offer. So we'll tie all this up with, uh, with a, a kind of forward looking look at opportunities and challenges for Drupal in this space. Um, so what we've essentially got here is this widely changed landscape for B2B commerce. And what Drupal Commerce allows you to do is kind of do what this guy did, right? Build yourself a life raft to help you get around in this new environment that's completely unique to your needs, right? But using the tools available to help you navigate this new, uh, this new space, which is great, right? And if you're a B2B organization, you can do this fairly cheaply compared to other uh, off the shelf or uh, proprietary platforms to allow you to transact and meet your specific needs by kind of pulling together these modules and, and get you around in your environment. Uh, the thing to think about though is in this new environment, sooner or later, right, one of these other proprietary companies is gonna offer you a brand spanking new branded rowboat to help you get around in that environment too that has all those things kind of pre-built in it. So that's one of the things we wanna think about when it comes to Drupal Commerce. Um, so, how do we build on the advantages that we have to continue to make Drupal potential go-to in the new B2B uh, commerce opportunity? So the things that are, that are open or available to us is really there's no one really doing all of those things well at a reasonable cost, 
right? There's companies out there, uh, you know, the Oracles and Hybris, Hybris of the world will meet all of those business requirements for you for tens of millions of dollars sometimes, right? So if you want to do those without that type of budget, um, no one really enables you to do that except for Drupal Commerce. Uh, the number of new prospective clients or customers out there, organizations that are looking to transact online, is huge, right? As we talked about, only 44% of current companies are now selling online. Uh, and they're probably a lot of those 44% are selling online very poorly. So there's a big like pent up demand for new e-commerce sites in the B2B space. Uh, and B2B organizations are waking up to this opportunity to the need to transform their business and start selling online. And the reason why, or one of the reasons why they're uh, waking up is that Amazon business is already there and taking business away from them, right? Amazon businesses was the largest uh, both in terms of total volume and growth percentage, largest B2B commerce provider uh, transaction last year, right? And they're selling all the stuff that these plumbing companies used to be able to sell through their, their kind of traditional channels of fax and phone, and Amazon business is going in there. Uh, so a lot of people are waking up to that. But there's challenges there too, right? So all those guys, those logos across the top, those are all the licensing platform, the, the current kind of licensed e-commerce platforms that are, even as we speak, retooling their systems to go after this market opportunity, right? And a lot of them are already out there marketing saying that they can service B2B commerce requirements, even those five we talked about. Some of them have some truth to them. Some of them are kind of selling smoke and mirrors, but all of them are going after that opportunity and investing a lot of money to try to be the preferred platform there. Uh, and frankly, Drupal does not have great brand recognition already in that B2B space. So there's a bit of a uh, awareness um, and familiarity obstacle to, to uh, get over. Uh, and then as we talked about the value of extensibility and the flexibility to build your own life raft using the, the materials that are available to you, that value can diminish as more off the shelf configurable B2B option uh, uh, appear. Organizations that say, yep, this is absolutely specific to your B2B needs, and you just need to move this little knob here and there to change your price breaks, uh, to change your volume pricing rules, to set up your customer portal. Once you have that, then the value of building your own life draft uh, diminishes. So that's kind of the, the commerce and op uh, the, the opportunity we have available to us. Um, so let's wrap all this up and talk about key points that you should walk out of this room with. Uh, so first key point, again, B2C, uh, B2B commerce requirements pose unique challenges for typical commerce platforms. They can't do it, or you gotta customize the heck out of it to get it to do what you wanna do in a B2B environment. Uh, and you kinda gotta build a net new customized platform that no longer looks like the proprietary system you bought. Um, Drupal and the data model and the concepts and the, uh, the Drupal commerce modules, all of those things help currently to address some of those unique B2B needs. Um, but there's this limited window, right, for Drupal commerce and us in this room to take advantage of that opportunity and really try to cement uh, Drupal and Drupal Commerce as a, as a preferred platform uh, to solve that B2B commerce need. So those are things you should walk away with. We have a couple minutes for questions. And our contact information is up there if you didn't get it earlier. You can step up to the mic, please, sir. Yeah, if you, just because it's being recorded, they, they asked us to make sure people come up to the mic for questions. To a problem with a lot of our smaller clients that don't have maybe a big fancy ERP um, or any other kind of system that really can integrate with a website and oftentimes they have to duplicate their business practices on a website any sort of strategies to help mitigate that or reduce that redundant or dull effort yeah so it sounds like the, the got clients that may not have any system of record or ERP system for their products or their pricing and they don't want to have to build it for the first time maybe in the website. They don't want to, if like they're gonna build it, they don't want to put all that knowledge into a package. They just kind of want to keep what they've got but still be able to sell online. Right. Fair enough? Yeah. Got it. I'm gonna take that one. Yeah, so I guess, you know, a couple things. One is, uh, um, you know, on the Drupal side, if they if they have a need, you know, say they're doing all that that stuff manually today, and like if there is absolutely no system of record and it's just purely manual processes and things being done over email and paperwork and things like that, uh, we have had some customers like that, especially early on, 
And we actually use Drupal to help kind of model some of those scenarios. So then you can, you could take the platform that's running their website and kind of extend that and allow that to be a tool uh, for some of their back office administration. So definitely not making the case for Drupal to become a, an ERP or to become a PIM system. Um, but it is flexible and you could, you know, potentially put some of those models in that system, um, you know, at least until they have the opportunity to, um, you know, find a, a proper platform. I will also say just from kind of our experience in the e-commerce world, some of these big, heavy uh, ERP solutions that you think of that are hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, um, there are a number of players out there that are making smaller uh, software as a service versions of those. Um, you can integrate to, you know, via cloud or via you know, connectors through, uh, through their services. So, you know, there could be something out there that you guys um, evaluate for them that could serve that ERP need, but maybe it's a, um, you know, kind of a monthly subscription base or something that's not a, a big kind of heavy uh, um, you know, JD Edwards type of tool that you have to implement for them. Other thoughts or discussion points? couple things to remind you of while you're thinking of questions. Sprints tomorrow. We've got some guys that will be sprinting. Hope you guys see you uh, as well. Um, so certainly make time to continue to contribute to the community here tomorrow. Uh, and our evaluation link is up here as well. You can just find our session uh, in the uh, in the DrupalCon schedule. Uh, feel free to tell us what we think. This is again our first time presenting at DrupalCon uh, and we want to continue to refine our craft as presenters so we look forward to getting your feedback. Uh, other questions or thoughts? All right. Thanks guys. Oh, maybe we got one more. I cut it off too early. Sorry. Yeah, one question. Yeah. Um, so you said that you push them or that you'll integrate with an ERP system. Yes. Have you ever talked to people about trying to move more and more in the direction of using Drupal? I know this is a little similar, I guess, to the other question, but. Instead of an ERP system? Yeah. yeah. You might just have to speak into it a little bit more. Um, so, so do your, uh, you've talked about integrating with ERP systems. Yes. Um, have you talked about moving like key pieces of that more into Drupal as a part of like a transition to a Drupal thing? So like inventory to start out with, or I mean, obviously to get offline orders into a Drupal system, they need to be in the Drupal database anyways. So you could integrate all of that or you could build a new interface, kind of wrap it around. Does that make sense? Yeah, if I can maybe re restate that. So the question is, yes, we can integrate into ERP systems. That's great. But what if there's like pieces of information that, Boy, you got to wonder if they even should be in the REP system, and they maybe more belong in Drupal or in the Commerce platform. And are we able to kind of coach clients through that process? Yeah, I mean, uh, so from like a, a project side or a system implementation side, like I would, um, I would actually kind of lean away from that. Um, you know, the things that you really want in Drupal are going to be your your product displays. Um, in some cases, your full like record of SKU. Sometimes you might be pulling that out of the, the ERP or your product information management system. Um, but I would I would kind of caution, uh, especially if they have another system in place, making Drupal do all the things and all the things that it, it might not shouldn't do. And a couple of considerations for that. One is uh, you know they might have other channels. Obviously, they probably likely do if they're B two B that are outside of the web. They're already reliant on this ERP system. Um, and ERPs do a lot of things well with managing those managing those channels. So to get that and kind of pull it into Drupal, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think it would offer necessarily like a lot of a lot of advantages. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would what I would recommend is like letting the key systems that the client uh, has in place do the things that you know they're designed to do and they're good at, and, and focus more on how to uh, share. sure that it has a method to play nicely with those other systems, you know, more so than kind of trying to, trying to take Drupal and, and, you know, make it replace, replace one of those systems. That question has definitely come up in terms of product information management systems. I think that's probably the most common. If people don't have a, a PIM system, which helps them manage their product data, um, and they're just, say, using spreadsheets today, um, sometimes that does kind of 
Drupal can kind of turn into a pen system to help them manage that and get their information more centralized. Um, but definitely with an ERP, I would say, you know, keep them separate and let the ERP do what it's, what it's designed to do. I can add on that a little bit, though. I think there's certainly instances where the client's ERP system, as you talk about, like is ancient and it may not all be all that sturdy. Um, so there's times when we're actually pulling information out of the ERP system, but that thing can fall over, right, if you breathe on it heavily. Maybe it's running on, on a server under somebody's desk. Um, so there's still need need to, like, disconnect your dependence upon that ERP, ERP package. You don't want to certainly make a connection. The, your ability to take a transaction dependent upon your ability to connect to the ERP package. So you want all the data in Drupal, even if it's coming from the ERP package, and if the ERP thing falls over, you can still continue to run, run online, take transactions, present product data. So that kind of limits your exposure to the risk of an ancient, out-of-date ERP system. It allows you to kind of just keep going with all that knowledge sucked into ERP. But still, your system of records should probably be that back-end system. Other thoughts, questions? Cool. I think we're at time. Thanks, everybody. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm on second time, man. Jeez. So I was wondering. Um, are there any places to go to find examples of where these sort of solutions have been implemented so that every time I have a complex thing, there's, I don't have to like learn the whole rule system and try to figure out how to put all the pieces together. Are there things that people have done before that work really well and can be used as a template for repeating that in my own use case? Yeah, so, right, so is there a library of like examples of how people solve these problems before beyond like our website and the case studies we've got up there? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are um, you know, in terms of just, like, seeing examples of this, like, live, you can definitely look at our client list. Commerce Guys main, maintains, I think, still maintains a long list of, uh, you know, example clients that are using Drupal Commerce. And that's, that's handy to at least go and kind of see from, like, a front-end user perspective, like, how something could potentially be set up or built. Um, in terms of, you know, there being, like, a guidebook for B2B Commerce with that I'm not that I'm aware of in particular. Um, you know, obviously we could we could be resources for that and uh, provide our contact information for any questions there. It's also not a bad idea to, um, you know, potentially that's a gap or a, a book that could be written, a yeah. guidebook that could be prepared. So um, definitely a good idea there. But yeah, in terms of it being all kind of condensed and um, assimilated, not that I'm not that I'm aware of. Sounds like a good need, yeah, yeah. sir. Good talk. So, so ba great talk, actually. Basically, when you guys start talking, I, st I put up a chart of like 15 gaps that I see B2C to B2B, and I ticked off most of them. A uh, few questions. So how complicated these pricing rules can get? Like, I'm looking at stuff like, r I mean, these contracts can get really complicated. Yeah. You know, rate change tied to inflation or tied to material yeah. pricing effectively when that rate change can happen, discounts based on volume, discount based on cumulative volume, on and yeah. on and on. Yes. So how flexible that uh, area is. Yeah, you can probably speak to that and talk to some of the stuff we've done with, um, with Hawk. And a lot, of t t a lot of times the question is, depends on where you want that pricing logic to live. Right. right? Does it live in, in Drupal? Okay, we can build it in there. Or can we just read it from another system? Some some system that may not be web enabled but has all that data in there. ERP, even better. But right. I want to speak to that. Yeah, and it can get you know it can get very very complex. And what what we found is um, you know typically every customer you engage with on the B two B side has different has right. a variation of all of those rules. Right. And so what happens is you might you know you might not be able to use the same implementation approach that you right. used on a, a previous right. project for that. Uh, one great thing though, I mean, if they if they are selling through other channels, like Chris mm -hmm. said, they've had to they've had to solve that problem before. Yeah. Now you just have to make it you know logical and, and get it to the web. Yeah. Um, so they have they they have modeled their data about how to price or how to account for all these yes, somewhere, right? Yes. So and, and in some cases, it's not un, it's not unusual where they don't have a model and they literally say we deal with ten thousand customers. Every single customer for every single product right. has a negotiated price, and we've defined that over the last 20 years, right. and we're not willing to not willing to change that. And I'd say when Chris and I started kind of doing some B2B commerce projects back in 2005 or so, right. we really did have to change their business if uh -huh. they wanted to put that information on the 
web because it was just prohibitive to have a structure like that. Right. Drupal Commerce is actually the first platform that we've worked with that's allowed us to model some of those very complex, very unique situations um, and not have it be a, a cost prohibitive solution. As a follow on question, so when you're talking about pulling the data from the ERP system, I kind of heard two different things. Are you talking about continuously syncing or are you talking about maybe federating that data as needed? Yeah, and, and the both actually. So both kind of depending on the depending on the scenario. So we've had um, examples where I think what Chris was alluding to before, you know, where you'll go to a customer site, you'll go to their warehouse and they literally have uh, a server closet that is their closet or maybe their break room and they've got this old, you know, this old system that's been up and running, legacy system for uh, 20 years. In those cases, um, what we've done is, you know, replicate the data, kind of get it out of their warehouse, maybe get it into the cloud in a replicated database. Um, and then if, you know, if performance is good, we can query against that and basically have a, um, uh, kind of reach into that database and pull information out in real time as, you know, pages are loading on the web. So we don't necessarily have a record of that in Drupal, per se, uh, but we'll rely so um, one of our example clients has roughly 700,000 products online for sale, and a lot of their product attribute information comes out of their ERP, um, because what they have is uh, other manufacturers who are sending them feeds of product data information and product attributes. So those feeds go into their ERP, they can change basically at any time. So every time we build a product page for display, we have to go and pull kind of the latest attributes so you wouldn't want to store that in Drupal necessarily because you'd have tons of sync jobs and you'd have 700,000 nodes that you have to keep up to date and constantly resave all the time. So, so eight gigabytes of disk. What's that? Seven eight gigabytes of disk. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so being able to, to connect with that in real time in that situation is very important. Um, on smaller projects or on projects where maybe you know you want that information in. Uh, Drupal for other reasons to be maybe more compatible with rules or other modules that are being used. In those cases, we recommend kind of setting up a migration and pulling that in. I'm scared to say it now. <laughs> <laughs> the doors of the church are open if you'd like to come down to the front. You can. Any other questions? All right, awesome. Thank you guys for listening. Have a great yeah, day thank today. Thank you very much. Enjoy your DrupalCon.